wanted to quickly just give you a little bit of my testimony. I got saved on October the 10th of 2010. God made that one easy to remember. Because <laughs> otherwise I'd forget it. Because I forget my own anniversary, my own birthday. Never mind my kids or my husband's birthdays. Yeah. So, but, um, my background is my parents were both, um, into witchcraft, atheists, agnostics. They went through the, the gamut there, but my mom practiced witchcraft. And that was all I knew basically growing up. Uh, but I never got into it or liked it or any, you know, like I was always considered the black sheep of the family, the rebellious one, because I wasn't going along with their ways. And that didn't make a lot of sense to me until I was older and raising my son and you know, me and my husband. My husband got on at a church, working as a facilities manager, and that was my first experience with anything to do with religion or God or anything. And mm -hmm. I ended up getting saved um, just a few months after we started going there because I would go to, it was kind of expected that the family would be involved, you know, on Sundays and stuff. So I would go to Sunday school and I didn't really get a lot out of the Sunday school class, but I would sit there and read the Bible while like they were talking and stuff because they didn't know anyone. And this was very much kind of not my element of people. You know, I was like very, I'm kind of naturally and especially at that point, was very, very shy. I didn't talk to a lot of people and didn't really like to be, you know, in involved in a lot of activity. And this was throwing me into activity. And so I was kind of like the hang, you know, kind of hanging back, kind of in the back of the classroom kind of thing. And would just kind of read the Bible and stuff. Ended up getting saved when I trusted that Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and believed that with everything in me. And I mean, like, it... At that point, I was in a really low place, like, you know, like, my head was a mess, and I was still just, like, really, nah, all messed up, basically, <laughs> and instant peace, I mean, like, things that had been with me for my entire life, the peace that, knowing that that was what was missing, and needing Christ in my life, that brought peace to me. And also, I immediately started studying my Bible, um, like, really right then. I mean, I was already reading it, but it wasn't really making sense until I understood that, you know, I needed Jesus to fill me to be able to understand it. And then I started understanding things, and just little bits, and just started studying from there. And now I have, for Probably the last five years, maybe six, I have read the Bible every single year. And um, I read through Paul's epistles every single month. Because those are the ones that were written directly to, for, and about us who are saved today during the dispensation of grace. Um, so that's just like the really fast in a nutshell. <laughs> I had planned to do it a lot longer than that, but I didn't expect my internet to crash on me. So um, that's just the quick... Who I am, what, why, how I got here. And so, the main thing I'm just going to say right up front is I do use the King James Bible exclusively, and I know that not everyone does, but I do have very strong convictions on why I use it. So, if you're ever interested in that, just shoot me a message and I'll be happy to give you some material on that. The Bible is my, my main standard, my only final authority that I rely upon. And um, I, I won't share a teacher if what they teach doesn't align with what I read in scripture. Um, I, but I do have some stuff on that, that I've written or trusted teachers have written. There's a few that I do, um, listen to, uh, other teachers. We don't have a local assembly because there are no local assemblies here. My husband left the, uh, church he was working at, uh, about three and a half years ago. And we have since been following, um, Grace Family Bible Church on YouTube. You can find them. It's under Unlock the Bible Now is the website um, with Brother Scott Mitchell as the pastor. So um, that's, it's a satellite church thing that we do um, because that's the one that found, that we found that was the closest to what the Bible actually said. And I, if you're looking for a Bible study to, or, you know, lessons to a church to, that's a good option. And you can message me for more information about that or comment below and I'll leave a 
blink or something. But um, we're going to get started. So the first thing to study in the Bible is you have to have the right tools. Um, and the first and most important tool is you have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And that happens when you are saved. So, um, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 14 tells us that when we are saved, that then the Holy Spirit comes into us and dwells in us. And that when we have that, then we are able to understand scripture because the Holy Spirit helps us to understand it. So I'm going to read that passage and then go over a little bit more. But as it is written... I'm going to have to move my phone for a second. So you're going to get a funky view of my sewing machine behind my shoulder and a hot mess of my studio. So I can actually read this. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man things which God hath prepared for him, them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. And that's what I meant by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's his word and what it means you know what he's saying to us through his word which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth that is why i do not rely heavily on books that men have written but the bible as my final authority which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth but with which the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spir spiritually discerned. And that last little bit there meant that if you're not saved, you're not going to understand the Bible, really. It's not going to make any sense because you're the natural man, and you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in you to help you understand it. So it basically seems like foolishness to you. And I can say that before I was saved, yeah. Uh, when I first started reading the Bible, I was just like, because it was before I was saved. And I'm just like, what? Yeah, it didn't make any sense. And I kind of got the order out too, because I started in the book of Revelation. Because that was the one thing that my mother did know about, besides witchcraft, was she could quote verses like certain events that were going to occur out of the book of Revelation and she used to use it to terrify me and I was like eight so you know I knew some of that and so it, it kind of messed with my head but anyway how, so how do we know that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us by believing the gospel and by trusting that Christ died for our sins was buried and rose again the third day and when we do that when we just believe that he already did everything for us and there's nothing we can do and we just have to believe that when he says it's enough it is enough it is more than enough so Ephesians 1 13 to 14 tells us that in whom we trust ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also, after that you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. That literally just means that when we believe the gospel, we are saved, sealed, mm -hmm. and seated in Christ for eternity, basically, until we're caught up or die first. I mean, until, but it ultimately, even the dead in Christ rise and are caught up. So we're sealed until the day, the, what does it say? The redemption of the purchased possession. We are his purchased possession. And we are to the praise of his glory. So I've already given you the gospel a couple times. So I think we can just kind of quickly hit that again. The gospel is found in the clearest, easiest to uh, explain, or it, you don't really need to explain it. It pretty much explains it itself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, where it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's right there. That's that's as plain as you need to be. You just believe it, and you're saved. Don't have to tell anybody. Don't got to do anything. Just believe. And know that he did it all. And there's nothing left for you to do other than to study, which is the biggest thing he tells us to do. He tells us to, it's his will that all men would be saved. Now, we know that not all men will be, but he wants them all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's what we're going to do here at Just Grace It. We are going to come to a knowledge of the truth. And we are going to study his word, his way. Because he does tell us how to in his, in his word. It's all laid out. So that's what we're going to be doing. So there's a few like keys that we can use to help us understand what the Bible, you know, understand how to study it and how to understand what it says. And that is to look at it and see who is speaking in any passage or verse. For instance, if we look at Matthew 4, 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is spoken out of the, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And Jesus spoke that. He was actually speaking to Satan. <laughs> but, um... You know, it, it really matters who is speaking because that helps us know who the audience might be and who they were speaking to because that's the next thing. You want to see who they are speaking to. Um, and if they're, you know, if they're speaking to, say, like when God was in the burning bush and he spoke to Moses, he wasn't speaking to us. He was speaking to Moses. So, you know, it's important to notice who is speaking who is speaking, who they're speaking to. Um, there are some passages that I can share. Um, but Matthew 4, 4 speaks of who is speaking, as does Genesis 3, 4 and Romans eleven thirteen. In Genesis 3, 4, the serpent is speaking. He speaks to the woman. He says, and the serpent said, said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So there we have, we've had in Matthew, it was Jesus. In Genesis, it's the serpent. In Romans eleven thirteen, for I speak unto you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. That's the apostle Paul speaking. So you can see it's important who is speaking. And then to whom are they speaking? Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, I gotta flip it, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So that was spoken to Israel, the nation of Israel. That was God's people at that time. They were called by his name. He's the one that gave them the name Israel. And he promised them the land. So in that one, it was clearly, it was um, spoken to the nation of Israel. Ephesians 1, 3, we see... It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That one is spoken to us. That is actually one of my very favorite verses on what we have as believers in Christ, as saved individuals today. That we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And if you've seen some of my things, I, that verse plays throughout a lot of the stuff that I make. Because it is one that I go back to all the time for when I'm just like all discombobulated and need some, you know, need that swift kick to get me back where I need to be. That's one of my go-tos. As is 1 Corinthians 10, 31, when I feel like I'm not one to do something, I, you know, towards work. <laughs> Pick vegetables, clean, you know, clean the house, scrub toilets, any of that. I go to this one because it's spoken directly to for and about me as well. Wherefore, therefore, ye, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And that was actually spoken to the Corinthians. Paul wrote it to the Corinthians, but it's, um, it's two saved individuals today. 
So context of who they're speaking to really does matter. And the, another biggie is when they are speaking because, you know, we all recognize that there's divisions in the Bible. I mean, we're not out building arcs and that kind of thing. Sometimes I wonder if we're not going to need to when it starts pouring the rain down here in Kentucky. Because, shoo, we can get some doozies. And that creek behind me, it can rise fast. But I know that God's never going to flood the whole earth again. So I know that I don't need to build an ark. But Noah, Noah did. He had to build an ark. Or he wasn't going to get saved if he didn't obey God. So it's important to look at when they're speaking. Um, with Moses, we know that we're not supposed to just like go wonder you know, into Egypt and pull the people out and all that stuff because we know that that was spoken specifically to Moses during his time. And so a few verses that help us understand that are Luke 9, 6. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. That was the 12 disciples. And it was spoken specifically to I believe that was the 12. It was the 12 or the 70. I do get those mixed up sometimes. But it was spoken during Jesus' lifetime. And it was about the time period right then. Um, Matthew, or Luke 9, 44 and 45 um, is also very dispensational to that specific time. It talks about, um, let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. So that is literally talking about the 12 disciples. Jesus told them he was going to be delivered up and crucified, killed by men, and they're just like, say what? I don't think I heard you right. Nah, I don't think so. They didn't believe it. They should have believed it. It was all through the Old Testament. The, you know, like the book of Isaiah is full of that. But they didn't get it. So, you know, it mattered who was being spoke. you know, what the time period was. They weren't supposed to get it yet. They actually don't get it for quite some time. <laughs> so there's other passages throughout. Um, the book of Matthew is really good for finding them. Uh, Matthew 10, 5 to 7, and 15, 24 are a couple of good ones that you can see where God says that, or where it shows that it's spoken to a very specific group of people. For instance, Matthew 15, 24 says, But he answered and said, I am sent not, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that was spoken very specifically by Jesus. It couldn't be spoken by anyone else. And it was spoken about a very specific group of people. He said he was literally sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then like when we come to Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. That can't be spoken to, that couldn't have been spoken back in when Jesus was alive and walked the earth. Because it wasn't necessarily true. They were still very much under the law. But today we're not under the law. Thank God for it. We're under grace. And that's only true of us today. I mean, there's God's grace is always what saves people, but the way it's applied is different for different time periods. So we know this by taking the scriptures literally. Like, unless it's an obvious allegory or, you know, something that you know is not supposed to be taken literally, take it literally. Just let the plain sense... The perfect sense, if the plain sense makes perfect sense, seek no other sense. There's no need to. Read it just like you would, giving it the same sense you would any other book. Because we don't try to switch up, like, you know, Shakespeare or, uh, I don't know. I tear books up. I don't really read that many of them anymore. So I'm on a complete blank. Like the Narnia books. That's probably the last book series, books that I really read. And I read those with Morgan when we, we were homeschooling. And some examples of this are like, I don't have these typed out, sorry guys. So I'm actually going to have to look them up. So I'm not going to do as many of them. Nehemiah 8.8 8 shows us an example of where just letting it m make the plain sense is the way to go. 
Nehemiah 8.8. 8. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And that's just letting the plain sense make perfect sense and don't give it any other sense. If it's not an allegory, don't treat it like an allegory. If it's not, a, what's those things? Uh, like where they call Jesus the lamb and stuff. I forget the word for that, but um, if it's not. Okay. So we've talked about the plain sense. Don't give it any other sense. Similes. That was one of the words I was trying to think of. And I forget the others. But y'all know what I'm talking about. It's been a while since I taught grammar. So, um, Luke 1, 30 to 33 is a good example. Matthew 16, 18. John 1, 29. This will be pinned in the comment or the uh, featured. So you guys can go back and look these up. Um, and Revelation 120, and I do want to go to that one because that one's a really good example of how we just give it the plain sense. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. We wouldn't... Um, you know, give that any other sense because it pretty much tells us exactly what it means. The mystery of the seven stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven cand golden candlesticks are the seven churches. It explains it for us. So we don't need to look for any other sense. It's just explained for us. And we just take it the way it says it. And we also can use what's called scripture with scripture. Iron sharpens iron, a lot of people say. That's just where you take like a passage of scripture and you compare it to another passage and it helps you understand it. <coughs> a good example showing us to do that is second Peter one twenty. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And that just means literally that it's, you can't take a passage out of context and just make it mean whatever you want. And I know a lot of times we do that. I've been guilty of it myself. Um, a lot of just like kind of, oh, I like this. I'm going to make it, you know, about something that it's not really about. And we, you know, it happens. So we need to watch about that and just let it, you know, if we don't understand it, instead of running to like a concordance or a lexicon, I, I don't even know the words of those commentaries. My words are gone today. <laughs> but instead of like running to a commentary to see what it says, try to find like a key word in it or something that you can look up using a concordance. That was, you do want to use concordances and do a word search and see if you can find like the first use of a word. To help you understand what is meant in that passage. And actually, usually the first use of a word is going to be the predominant meaning for that word throughout scripture. There will be other meanings to it too, but that'll be the main one. So you, you can kind of just like apply that one first and see if that makes any sense. And if not, start looking for other verses to help you understand it. Um, 1 Corinthians 2.13 helps us. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 2 understand that as well which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth so that's mean don't run to man's books run to god's word but which the holy ghost teacheth and that's where the indwelling of the holy spirit is so important because he is actually the one that teaches us and helps us to understand these things comparing spiritual things with spiritual it's this scripture with that scripture and you get a clear understanding. Very, very good example of where you do need to follow the scriptures, like the different references, is understanding like the commission that Jesus gave the 12. He gave them one commission at first, then he gives them a little bit more to it. And then by the time you get to Acts, he's given them the full thing of that they're supposed to go, yo, know, in a certain order. And he actually has already told them they won't be out of it. Israel before he returns. And that brings me to the last part of how to study it, 
which is remoter context. Sometimes there will be a verse in, like, like the verse, there's a verse in Paul, or in, that Paul speaks that talks about how he was born as one out of due time. That actually is referencing the book of Isaiah. Because it talks about him over there. So without those two together, it doesn't always make sense. So we kind of have to compare, again, scripture with scripture. And sometimes it may take a verse here and go way back in like Genesis or something. There's In the book of Jude, it talks about the angels that left their first estate. That's explained in Genesis 6. And it's the Nephilim. So we see it throughout scripture in that way. And that really does help us to understand it better. And there's one more trick to really understanding it. And that is to understand the timeline of God's twofold plan and purpose to restore both heaven and earth in one in Christ. And he does that through the nation of Israel on the earth and us the new creature being formed today during the dispensation of grace in heaven. And then eventually it's all going to become one, um, one heaven, one earth. When we get the new one at the end of the 7,000 years that he laid out for it. So God has a twofold plan and purpose to restore all things in one in Christ. That means that he's using the nation of Israel to restore the earth and that will happen during the um, millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And that's in the future. But right now, he's forming the church, the body of Christ, during the dispensation of grace. And we have a heavenly calling. And that is pretty cool. That's why we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Because we are heavenly people. Now, we will come back to the earth, but it'll be when the earth heaven comes to earth and when Christ comes back to earth but we go up there with him first so we can see the layout that God gave for scripture when we just literally read it like it starts out you know like it says you have what's known as time past and this is in Ephesians 2 11 and 12 I'm going to be flipping back and forth here, so just bear with me for a second. In Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, it says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. That is the Gentiles that are called uncircumcision. That was Gentiles, like uh, anybody who wasn't Jewish, basically. And the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that was all of the Jewish people. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That is when God, that but now, that's us right now. We're in the but now period. Because right now, God doesn't have, he's not working through Israel to save people. He's just literally working through Christ. You know, Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and that's how we're saved. That's not exactly how it worked for Israel. They had things they had to do for that to, um, to be able to get through to when Jesus would return and then they would have eternal life. It, they had it promised to them, but it would be fulfilled at a different point. We have it as a present possession, even though we physically this body will die we get a glorified body so we have to shed this one it's not like changing from everyday clothes to uh fancy smancy clothes you know like getting all dressed up like i get dressed up i didn't even get dressed up for my wedding <laughs> but yeah you know. okay and then ephesians 2 7 which is just a few verses up tells us that in the ages to come he might shoo the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And that's talking about in the ages to come is when this dispensation or age ends, which is the dispensation of grace, which will probably happen pretty soon in probably the next 40 years or so, because 
God kind of had a 7,000 year layout. That was the whole seven days of creation thing. Each day was a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. And there's seven days. So there has to be 7,000 years, give or take. It may not be 7,000 to the day, but, you know, it'll be approximately 7,000 years. And when those are up, Um, when our time period is up, which is going to be about 2,000 years, which is almost up. Jesus died probably 33 AD. So about 2,000 years. And we're almost at the end. Thank goodness. Because if it gets much crazier down here, I, I don't know, guys. It's weird. <laughs> you know, it's weird down here. So anyways, the Ages to Come talks about when the Millennial Kingdom will be on Earth. And it also talks about after that. In eternity, or what is also called the eighth day sometimes. Yeah, that is when heaven and earth are one on the new earth. When we get the new heaven down here too. That's going to be the time to be alive. And amen that we will be, because it's going to be exciting. So that is a very, very quick description of the dispensations. Time passed, but now ages to come. Time passed has a very distinct message. It's all about prophecy, the prophets. It's also most of the Bible. And it's spoken to the nation of Israel. It revolves around the law and the earth or land that they were promised. The same is true of the ages to come. They are very much prophetic. The book of Revelation talks about it. Um, the book of Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah... Ezekiel, my bad. Uh, it's throughout um, Micah. There's, you know, it's it's prophetic in nature. It's also spoken. It's all throughout Scripture. Eighty-five percent of Scripture is about it. It's to the nation of Israel again mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are going to inherit the earth, and it's based on the law being the. Um, it's the new law, though. It's the law that Jesus gives. It's not necessarily the old law of Moses. But it is law based and it will involve the earth. But now is the mystery hid in God since before the world began. That means before God even said, let there be light. He had this in his head because Satan had already fallen at that point. He created them all before he said, let there be light in time past when he said, um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth in Genesis 1-1. That's when that time period is when mm -hmm. Satan fell. And then um, the new creation, so to speak, was let there be light. And he created from the chaos that was there. It said that um, there was darkness over the face of the deep. That's, that's a sign that it was judged. So what we live on today is actually the second creation. And then there's going to be a third one that's going to restore it back to what it was originally, except without sin. Thank God. Because, yeah, it'll be a good thing. But there's the, it's like a graphic of the sunrise that shows this. And it says, see past, present, and future. It explains that and gives you the uh, layout. Because, but now, the mystery that was hidden, which is the body of Christ being formed today, For where we are at today, on the chart, there is a, a, a yellow area that says dispensation of grace. And that's what this is called, the dispensation of grace. And yes, dispensation is a Bible word. It's in there four times in the King James. I don't know about other versions because, again, I don't read them. I used to read the ESV for like a hot minute. That was it. Um, and very quickly found the King James and stuck with it. Um, but... In the four Gospels, Jesus is, Jesus in the four Gospels is presented in one way and Paul presents him a different way because Paul was saved by the glorified risen Christ who came down from heaven to save him. And on earth, Jesus was actually among, you know, he preached a slightly different message. So the difference in 
those two messages is important to understand because it helps us understand who we are today because Jesus' instructions to us are different than what they were to the 12 disciples and to the nation of Israel. And if you print the times and dispensations chart out and really study it this week, I think you will come, you know, the verses are on there. It's way too much to go through it. Because you guys aren't going to want to hang on for that long. I can do it. I can gladly do it. But it will take a while. So I'm going to give you the overview of that, those differences, and then let you look them up and let me know what you think next week. So the nation of Israel was promised the land of Israel, and they um, – Right now, I don't really have it. They have a small portion of it. But they will eventually have all the land. And if you go back and look at what he told Abraham to look at, they get basically from, like, Egypt to, it's basically the whole Middle East. It's supposed to be Israel. It's huge. It goes from, like, the Euphrates to the, the I don't even know what all. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But they don't have it. So, there's a time, like, the Bible is laid out to help us understand that. That's why you have, like, the Old Testament tells what God did in the past. The That goes all the way through the four Gospels into the book of Acts. And the book of Acts shows us the transition from what God was doing, the prophecy-based program, for lack of a better word. I never know how to, you know, what that is. And we need to learn that because if we don't understand that, we can't understand what he's doing with us because it just gets confusing. But then you go into, um, starting with the book of Romans, it's about us. And it's talking about how we're saved and what we're supposed to be doing today. And it's called the revelation of the mystery, what Paul called it. And we're told that we walk by faith, not by sight. So there's not the signs that followed the prophetic program. But we have better things. We have spiritual things that they didn't necessarily get with, in the same way that we did. They had to uh, like actually kind of only certain ones had it, and you know it wasn't everybody. Not everybody had all of the uh, gifts. Like. The Holy Spirit came on them. He didn't dwell in them. So it was different how they got the stuff and what they got. It was very different. So um, the verses are there to look at, but I really want to focus on this dispensation of grace part. And that is found in Romans through Philemon. And there's a very distinct layout there. The book of Romans, the all throughout scripture is true. There'll be Portions of the books that are doctrinal, like the books of um, Moses, are very doctrinally based. Then you have books that are kind of correcting that. And then you have books that are, hang on, the word flew away from me. Doctrine, correction, the correction, and reproof. Or they're like, uh, the book of Galatians is reproof on the book of, doc of Romans. Romans is the doctrine. First and second Corinthians are the correction. And y'all, that's a hot mess in there. I'm telling you. And they were, they needed correcting. Lots of it. But the same is true of a lot of us today. So, and the Galatians were very much, they had kind of left the grace aspect of things and the grace life that God was giving them. And they were putting themselves back under the law and were trying to keep the law again. And that wasn't what God wanted. So we see doctrine in Romans, correction in 1 Corinthians, and reproof in Galatians. And it all centers around the cross of Christ and what that accomplished. And our faith in that and how we act that, you know, how that faith works in us. But then we move to Ephesians and it's a doctrine about the church. That's all of us in the, you know, together. And Ephesians corrects any bad understanding of the book of Ephesians, and Colossians reproves them. So, again, you see doctrine in Ephesians, 
correction in Philippians and reproof in Colossians. And it focuses on love, loving one another, loving, you know, it's showing that love to our fellow man and stuff and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we have his coming, which is first and second Thessalonians. And there is no correction or reproof because it's all doctrine. And it also tells about our hope, our his glorious appearing and our catching up to be with him in the air. And that basically ends the dispensation of grace. So we don't need to be corrected because we're out. We're done. And the prophetic program with Israel picks back up. And the 70th week of Daniel, also called the Great Tribulation, kicks off. And you have that whole Antichrist thing. And the book of Revelation is all about it. And there's tons of Isaiah and Ezekiel. And basically the scariest parts of the Bible are about to happen. <laughs> you know? They, Seriously, it, that's basically what's about to go down. And God's going to, you know, he's just going to straighten it all out. And then Jesus is coming back, establishing his kingdom for a thousand years. And that's when everything returns to like, sort of like what it was supposed to be in the beginning. But it's not quite because there's still sin. It says that people can still sin during that thousand years and die. Um, and at the end, Satan is actually loosed from the pit that he's chained in and He's not there now. He'll be chained at the end of the tribulation. But then he'll be loosed, and that's when he's going to come back and kind of lead some people astray. And then you have that whole cast them all into the lake of fire part that I really don't like because that's really scary, the great, great white throne judgment. It's a scary thing to think about. But it's also the thing that drives me to witness to people because in the back of my mind, I always think there's this song by the uh, Marshall family. You never mentioned him to me, and that has stuck with me so heavily, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this class, just in case somebody hears it at some point that doesn't know the gospel, hasn't been saved, or doesn't understand what we're doing today and what God's doing with us today. It gives them hope, and I always think, what if someone's standing at that judgment, that great white throne judgment, because if you're standing there at that one, honey, you didn't get saved under any dispensation. You blew it all the way around. You're, you know, they, they, they're not going to be saved. They, they can't be saved at that point. Those people won't be. They chose Satan, the God of this world, over the God who created us. And that stands in my mind. That song says, you never mentioned him to me. And it's talking about him standing there. They're getting ready to be cast into the lake of fire. And they look around to the people that they knew. I believe we'll all witness that. That's like the pinnacle of when right before the new heaven and new earth come. That's like the moment we're all waiting for, you know, because we're going to get the new thing and everything's going to be restored in one in Christ. So while we're waiting, you know, we're there. We're present for this. We're not in it, but we're watching it. We're spectators, so to speak. And I believe, I just think of what if someone turned to me and said, you saw me throughout my life. You know, you, you saw me day to day and you never mentioned him to me. That drives me because I think I don't ever want to hear someone turn around and say that to me. Because I do believe that hell is real. And I do believe that it is going to be a lake of fire where the worm dieth not and all this, you know, I really believe it all. And exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping to do is explain it so that you can explain it to others. Because when you can take what I've taught you and then you can teach someone else, I've done my job. And I just want to see people saved. That is like my main goal in life is to see them get saved and see them come to a knowledge of the truth and then go and do the same thing. Because when we do that, we're doing what God wants us to do today. That is like literally the purpose of salvation today is to get as many people in there as we can. Because as many people as we can get saved, that's, you know, I want us to be a big old huge body of Christ when we get up there, y'all. So then we've still got a few of Paul's epistles. We've got First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, and those are all about the congregation, the church working together as a whole. Like, not local church, but like, this is local church and church collectively. Um, it's our fellowship. That's what it is. Like, what we're doing today. So, um, 
that is pretty much the bulk of what I wanted to get over today. Starting next week, I'm going to start going through the book of Romans, which will really explain more of what I have went over because I know it's probably a different for a lot of you than what you're used to being taught. I had never heard this until my husband, who is probably more of a Bible geek than me, when he was working at the big church, he would go on his lunch breaks and basically anytime he could find five minutes, he had Bibles stashed everywhere and he would read them because he would watch what was going on in the church building, like the things that they were doing, like the stuff on Sunday. And then he would watch like the way they acted through the week. And it caused him to think all, you know, he had all these questions and he was like, the stuff that they were saying wasn't the same as what I was saying. And so he started reading and studying and he realized that there was differences that the way like Jesus taught when he was on earth was different than what he was saying through the books of Paul, that there was differences to it. Like, you know, the way things seemed to play out and the way things were you know, like the way salvation was being offered, just a lot of things seemed different. And that made him question. And he started really studying and he realized there was a difference. There was, you know, like um, Galatians talks about it, that there was what seemed to be circumcision and uncircumcision. I remember him coming to me and telling me that. And I looked at him and I was like, uh, what are you saying? But I it, it stuck in there and I started studying and I started seeing it. So if you look at 2 Timothy 2.15, and this is where it really got me. I heard we were watching a video on tithing, I believe it was, but there was the video showed this guy and he was standing in front of a chalkboard preaching and it was on the tithe. And the guy said something about he said, that's why we study to shew ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need us not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I thought, what? And I looked that one up because that one was kind of weird to me. And then I started chewing on it and marinating on it. And it hit me that there was differences. There was divisions in the Bible that Jesus was the same all throughout it. That God's, God was the same throughout time. But he dealt with men differently. And I kept going back to like Noah and the flood, Adam in the garden, Abraham. I just see in all these different people and how God dealt with them differently throughout time. And how what he told Paul was different than what he had told men before that. And it was different than what I saw in Hebrews through Revelation. Which is the other part of the story. That's the end. So basically... Genesis through Acts, or through John, really, is the past. It's history. It's time past. Acts shifts us into the but now, our dispensation, the dispensation of grace, which is today. And then Hebrews through Revelation takes us back into prophecy, but it's in the ages to come. It's the future. We have the past presence the future and that is the dispensational layout of scripture and that is what we are going to be following we're going to start in the but now because that's where we are at which starts with the book of romans which we will start studying next week and now i'm going to close this out with a prayer and if you guys have got any questions just shoot them into the comment section or shoot me a private message and i will check back in with it throughout the day i got to do a little bit of work before uh, i got to cook dinner tonight so I'm going to try and get a couple hours of work in and I got a couple things I need to do. So I'm going to wrap it with prayer and I want to thank you guys for being here. And I am so sorry for all the interruptions and the craziness. It'll be more organized next week because I know I'm just going to use the same setup because I actually like that. I have the big screen to look at and stuff. So, um, all right, God, thank you for this time. And thank you that I was able to persevere through the <laughs> frustrations and just let what was said here sink into the hearts of those who heard it or will hear it and let them marinate on it God and let it just let your word work in them if anyone who heard it wasn't saved yet then I pray that the gospel would that they would hear that message and if they've got any questions they get a hold of one of us somebody you know so that they can 
get those questions answered and they can trust that your son Jesus Christ is you in form and form and that he died for them for their sins and that he rose again the third day and they can have that assurance in him when they trust what he did for them so I just ask that in Jesus name amen y'all have a great day and we'll chat soon grace and peace